Welcome to the lectures on language theory. This is lecture number five, number seven within the course. And the second lecture in the second module of theoretical grammar. The lecture is delivered specially for the students of the Department of English and German Languages. The theme of this lecture is parts of speech, the verb, the categories of the verb. The outline of the lecture includes the following points. The problems of the parts of speech, the principles of division and classification into the parts of speech, notional and functional parts of speech, the verb as a notional part of speech, its formal and functional properties, and grammatical categories of the verb. Verbal categories of number and person, category of tense, category of aspect, voice, and mood. The whole lexical of the English language, like the one of all Indo-European languages, is divided into certain lexical grammatical classes, traditionally called parts of speech. The existence of such classes is not doubted by any linguist, though they might have different points of view as to their interpretation. Classification of the parts of speech is still a matter of dispute. Linguists' opinions differ concerning the number and the names of the parts of speech. The words of language, depending on various formal and semantic features, are divided into grammatically relevant sets or classes. The traditional grammatical classes of words are called parts of speech. Since the word is distinguished not only by grammatical, but also by semantic lexemic properties, some scholars, Smirnitsky for instance, refer to parts of speech as lexical grammatical series of words or as lexical grammatical categories. Professor Bloch traditionally called the part of speech is a type of introduced the term grammatical classes. He starts from the assumption that what is traditionally called a part of speech is a type of word which grammatically differs from other types of words. It should be noted that the traditional term part of speech was developed in ancient Greek linguistics and reflects the fact that at that time there was no distinction between language as a system and speech, between the word as a part of an utterance and the word as a part of lexis. The term parts of speech is accepted by modern linguistics as a conventional or non-explanatory term to denote the lexico-grammatical classes of words correlating with each other in the general system of language on the basis of their grammatically relevant properties. The main principles of word division into certain groups that had long existed were formulated by Sherpa quite explicitly. They are lexical meaning, morphological form, and syntactic functioning. Still, some classifications are based on some of the free features, for any of them may coincide neglecting the strict logical rules. In linguistics, there have been a number of attempts to build up such a classification of the parts of speech that would meet the main requirement of a logical classification, that is, would be based on a single principle. Those attempts have failed. Henry Sweet, the author of the first scientific grammar of the English language, divides the parts of speech into two main groups, the declinables and the indeclinables. That means that he considers morphological properties to be the main principle of classification. Inside the group of the declinables, he kept to the traditional division into nouns, adjectives, and verbs. Adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, and interjections are united into the group of the indeclinables. However, alongside of this classification, Sweet proposes grouping based on the syntactic function of certain classes of words. This leads to including nouns, pronouns, infinitives, gerunds, and some other parts of speech into the same class, which is incorrect. The Danish linguist Otto Jespersen suggested the so-called theory of three ranks, primary, secondary, and tertiary words. For instance, furiously barking dog, where dog is a primary word, 
mocking secondary and furiously tertiary. Another attempt to find a single principle of classification was made by Charles Fries in his book The Structure of English. He rejects the traditional classification and tries to draw up a class system based on the word's position in the sentence. His four classes correspond to what is traditionally called nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. Besides the four classes, he set off 15 groups, and yet his attempt turned out to be a failure, too, for the classes and groups overlap one another. Words on the semantic meaningful level of classification are divided into notional and functional. To the notional parts of speech of the English language belong the noun, the adjective, numeral, pronoun, verb, and the adverb. Contrasted against the notional parts of speech are words of incomplete nominative meaning and non-self-dependent mediatory functions in the sentence. These are functional parts of speech. To the basic functional series of words in English belong the article, the preposition, the conjunction, the particle, the modal verb, the interjection. So here you can see the eight parts of speech that most linguists agree to distinguish in the English language. They are nouns, pronouns, adverbs, adjectives, conjunction, articles, prepositions, and verbs. Now we'll discuss the verb as a notional part of speech, its formal and functional properties. The verb as a notional part of speech has the categorical meaning of dynamic process or process developing in time, including not only actions as such, but also states, forms of existence, various types of attitude and feelings. Formally, the verb is characterized by a set of specific word-building affixes, for instance, to activate, to widen, to classify, to synchronize, to overestimate, to reread, etc. There are some other means of building verbs, among them sound-replacive and stress-shifting models, for instance, blood, to bleed, input, to import. There is a peculiar means of rendering the meaning of the process, which occupies an intermediary position between the word and the word combination, the so-called phrasal verbs, consisting of a verb and a postpositional element. Some phrasal verbs are closer to the word, because their meaning cannot be deduced from the meaning of the verb or the meaning of the postposition separately. For example, to give up, to give in. Others are semantically closer to the word combination. For instance, to stand up, to sit down. A separate group of phrasal verbs is made by combinations of broad meaning verbs as to have, to give, to take, and nouns, to give a look, to have rest, to have a bite. The perceptual semantics of the verb determines its combinability with nouns denoting either the subject or the object of the action, and its combinability with adverbs denoting the quality of the process. In certain contexts, some verbs can be combined with adjectives and other verbs. The verb is the most complex grammatical class of words. It is the only part of speech in English that has a morphological system based on the six categories – person, number, tense, aspect, voice, and mood. Besides, there are two sets of verb forms, essentially different from each other – the finite forms and the non-finite forms – infinitive, gerund, participle, and two participles. The verb performs the central role in the expression of predication. That is, the connection between the situation described in the sentence and reality. The difference in the functional aspect is that the finite verb, with its categories of tense, aspect, voice, and mood, always performs the function of the verb predicate in the sentence, while the non-finite forms are used in the functions of the syntactic subject, object, adverbal modifier, attribute. Here you can see the list of the grammatical categories of the verb.
and the ca grammatical categories of tense, aspect, mood, and voice um, with their groups. For Traditionally, the category of number is treated as the correlation of the plural and the singular, and the category of person as the correlation of three deactive functions, reflecting the relations of the reference to the participants of speech communication. The first person, the speaker, the second person, the speaker spoken to, the person spoken to, and the third person, the person or thing spoken about. But in the system of the verb in English, these two categories are so closely interconnected, both semantically and formally, that they are often referred to as one single category, the category of person and number. In modern English, all verbs can be divided according to the expression of this category into three groups. Modal verbs distinguish no person or number forms at all. The verb to be has preserved more person number forms than any other verb in modern English. The bulk of the verbs in English have a distinctive form only for the third person singular of the present tense indicative mood. Thus, the category of person and number in modern English is fragmental and asymmetrical, realized in the present tense indicative mood by the opposition of two forms. The strong marked member in this opposition is the third person singular, he speaks, for instance, and the weak member embraces all the other person and number forms, so it can be called a common form. For example, speak. Tense is a verbal category which reflects the objective category of time and expresses the relations between the time of the action and the time of the utterance. Tense is an inherent verbal category interrelated with aspect. It is common practice to teach tense aspect forms in general English courses. In grammatical theory, this approach is supported by Ivanova, who distinguishes between pure tense forms and tense aspect forms, the latter being treated as the complexes expressing both temporal and respective meaning. Past, present, and future are the objective time divisions. However, it does not mean that tense systems of different languages are identical. Moreover, English grammar admits of two different tense systems. According to one interpretation, there are three tenses in English, present, past, and future, represented by the synthetic forms, write, writes, wrote, or analytical forms, will write. According to the other view, there are two grammatically relevant tenses in English, the present tense and the past tense. Some doubts about the existence of a future tense in English were first expressed by Henry Sweet and Otto Jesperson. This approach still prevails with many scholars. The phrases shall, will, plus infinitive are treated by them as ungrammatical. The category of aspect reflects the inherent mode of the realization of the process. The respective meaning can be inbuilt in the semantic structure of the verb. In the English verb system, lexical aspective meanings are expressed in the subclasses of terminative verbs, such as to start to come, and durative or non-terminative verbs, such as to go to move. These aspective verbal subclasses are grammatically relevant in so far as they are not indifferent to the choice of the aspective grammatical forms of the verb. On the other hand, the aspective meaning can be represented by various grammatical categories with their corresponding forms. Aspective grammatical change is not typical of the Russian language. In Russian, one can find a system of lexical grammatical forms actualizing verb respective characteristics of the perfective and the imperfective. When considering the English grammatical tradition, we are to deal with two sets of forms, the continuous forms and the perfect forms. There are different interpretations of these forms in linguistic literature. The continuous verbal forms 
analyzed on the principles of oppositional approach, admit of one interpretation and that is aspective. They reflect the inherent character of the process denoted by the verb. The position of the corresponding category is between the continuous and the non-continuous indefinite or simple verbal forms. The category of voice expresses the relation between the subject and the action, or, in the other interpretation, this category expresses the relation between the subject and the object of the action. The obvious opposition within the category of voice is that between active and passive. The relations between the subject, he, and the action, invite, in the two sentences are different. In the first sentence, he performs the action and may be said to be the doer or agent, whereas in the second sentence, he does not act or and is not the doer but the object of the action. The position active-passive is represented by a number of forms involving the categories of tense, aspect, and mood. The passive is the marked member of the position. Its characteristic feature is the pattern B plus participle 2, whereas the active voice is the unmarked. There are some practical aspects of the categorical opposition between the active voice and the passive voice. However, in theoretical approach, the problems of the reflexive voice, examples like he shaved himself, the reciprocal voice, for instance, they greeted each other, and the middle voice, the door opened, should also be considered. To put the problems of the reflexive voice and the, or the reciprocal voice into morphological terms is to find out if the self-pronouns or reciprocal pronouns can be auxiliary words serving to drive a voice form of the verb. In terms of syntax, it is to wonder if a self-pronoun or a reciprocal pronoun always performs the function of a direct object or makes up a part of predicate. As a result of profound studies, it has been shown that self-pronouns or reciprocal pronouns standing after verbs can be treated as denoting the object of the action. The category of mood is the most controversial category of the verb. The only points in this sphere which have not been disputed are there is a category of mood in modern English, and there are at least two moods in English verb, one of which is the indicative. As to the number of the other moods, their meanings and names, opinions today are as far apart as ever. What makes the problem even more difficult is that the category of mood differs in principle from the verbal categories of tense and aspect. While the categories of tense and aspect ca characterize the action from the point of view of its various inherent properties, the category of mood expresses the outer interpretation of the action as a whole, namely, the speaker's introduction of this action as actual or imaginary. The grammatical category of mood makes up a part of a general linguistic category of modality. The imperative mood in English is represented by the base form of the verb or the bare infinitive, for example, come. There are also lexicogrammatical forms of the imperative with the verb let. Let the children do it. Let's go and have some coffee. The imperative mood forms are limited in their use to one type of sentences, namely imperative sentences. Most British and American scholars do not recognize the verbal category of the imperative mood. They prefer to speak about the imperative sentences as a special type of utterances. The subjunctive mood has its own problems. It can be expressed by both synthetic forms, infinitive, were, the past indefinite, and analytical forms, should, would, plus infinitive. The latter are not recognized by many British and American scholars because they are homonymous to the word combinations of modal verbs with the infinitive.
This is all in brief concerning the content of this lecture. As usual, you are suggested to answer a list of comprehension questions. And uh, you are suggested a list of sources for further reading. Thank you for attention.